Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Future in Space Hangout, where every two weeks we take an in-depth look at the future of human spaceflight, the technologies of space, and the engineering challenges that face humanity's future in space exploration and discovery. I want to welcome everybody watching live, as well as those of you who are watching this hangout after the live event is over. Uh, my name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, and today we are continuing a series that was started by my co-host, Hardy Thronson, where we check in with the four main contenders for the next big space-based astronomical observatory. Now, I'm going to just give you a brief rundown of what they are, the four big uh, concepts that are being considered by NASA right now. The first one, LUVOIR, which stands for the Large UV Optical IR Surveyor which will tell the story of life by searching for signs of life on exoplanets the, and exploring the cosmic origins of life. It will have a huge wavelength range from the far ultraviolet to the near infrared, and its primary mirror will be up to six times larger than Hubble's. The next one is HABEX, which is the Habitable Exoplanet Explorer, which will search for signatures of habitability, including water, oxygen, or ozone, and it will also study the early universe and the life cycle of massive stars. Like Louvoir, Habax will be sensitive to ultraviolet, optical, and near-infrared wavelengths. There's also LINX, which I guess is not an acronym for anything, but it is the successor to the Chandra X-ray telescope currently up in space and will look at the universe in X-rays. Lynx will have a two orders of magnitude jump in sensitivity over Chandra, as well as the European Space Agency's Advanced Telescope for High Energy Astrophysics, which they're calling Athena. And that's due to launch in 2028. It will detect X-rays from black holes lighting up the first galaxies and from young stars and their planetary systems. But our hangout today will focus on the Origins Space Telescope, or OST. And our guests today have been working on the mission concept of a new space telescope that will probe the early universe, trace the path of water through star and planet formation, and search for signs of life in the atmospheres of exoplanets. It's considered a follow-on to the Spitzer Space Telescope, which has given us some amazing views of the universe, as well as the Herschel Space Observatory. OST will offer 10,000 times more sensitivity than any preceding far-infrared telescope. So our plan here is to visit these main mission concept teams each year until one of them is selected to see how things are progressing. So let me turn this over to my co-host and I'll let him tell you more about the selection process and when we might expect to hear about a winner. So Harley Thronson from the NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Harley? Yep, thanks very much. And this is a particularly exciting mission for me although it's been many years since I was a practicing astrophysicist when I was mainly observed uh, the wavelengths we'll be hearing about today and some of the science goals that we'll hear about today, although they progressed enormously since I undertook my last serious research program. But the research area, the scientific areas that we'll be talking about today uh, have been very close to my heart. So this should be very exciting. Um, and in fact, actually, um, I'm not going to put into, I'm not going to, put into context um, these four missions, the political context, the selection context. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to um, one of the two senior scientists that we have here. But before I do, we wanna make sure that we thank the two AAS's that make this possible, the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society. They don't endorse the content and opinions but they do endorse this activity. So <laughs> good, yeah, good, good clarification. But so uh, would would um, so we have uh, two colleagues I've known for many years, uh, Dave Lester. Sorry, <laughs> no, nope, no, don't. Dan Lester. David Lesowitz. My apologies. <laughs> no <laughs> Dan, problem. Yes, Dan Lester. <laughs> Actually, there's no Dave Lester. There probably is. <laughs> Lester is the is the guy I, I, I uh, have presentations with on Wednesday. Afternoons. <laughs> David Leiswitz, who's my colleague down the hall from my, in my building at Goddard Space Flight Center. And um, we have uh, Margaret Meisner from a, this, a distinguished scientist uh, at the Space Telescope Science Institute, but she is currently on sabbatical here at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, so with that, 
um, meandering um, introduction. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask, let's begin by asking uh, Margaret to put into context, well, to describe the process uh, from where we are now, where NASA is, as uh, Tony said, NASA is uh, has been funding um, design activities for four large, four major candidate missions for, you know, couple of decades or a decade and a half from now. So Margaret, where are you all going from here? What's the schedule? What are you all expected to deliver to NASA headquarters and then to the National Academies? All right. Thank you, uh, Tony and Har <clears throat> Harley for inviting us uh, to, uh, to talk about our favorite project, which is Origin Space Telescope Study. Um, we are in the throngs of putting together what we call the final report, um, and it's uh, we have two concepts we'll be presenting. Concept two, we're finishing up the engineering over the next month, and these are engineering at a level that you can kind of scope out the mission, uh, what they call concept maturity level three or four. Um, these concepts, along with the very strong science case we have, um, will be delivered um, to headquarters, there'll be a process where they're going to go through a costing exercise that's independent from us, and the final report will be delivered to the National Academy basically summer 2019. So summer 2019, we can kind of take a breath and they're like finally take a vacation or something. But we are, you know, working flat out, I think, as a sprint until then. Okay, great. Um, so I want to so thanks, guys, and I want to remind everybody that we are live. So please use this opportunity to speak directly with our guests through our live chat on YouTube. Which, if you're watching on YouTube, you can't miss it. And we also have a Discord server for those gamers out there, and the link to that is in our description box. And I'll be reading from both of those places as the hangout progresses. So please take advantage of uh, of of getting direct access to experts here working on the future of space astronomy. Now, as Harley mentioned, we're supported and endorsed, but the the content necessarily isn't endorsed by the American Astronautical Society, uh, as well as the American Astronomical Society. And also, I just want to mention Deep Astronomy Patreon patrons who whose financial support also help bring these hangouts to you. So uh, please, uh, uh, I want to thank everybody for their support uh, on, on all of these fronts. Okay, so let's see. Um, Margaret, The uh, uh, let's start, I guess, with, you, got, you mentioned that by summer 2019, all of these... Uh, uh, well, you at least have to have your proposal and ready and done. Uh, is that true from all for all of the projects, or is it yes, different? Yeah, no, we're all kept to the same schedule, so all of them will be uh, collated and submitted en masse to to the decadal. Uh, and in the meantime, we're also, of course, we continue our community outreach, and it's a very public process. We have now weekly telecons uh, that people can listen in on, and um, we just we anybody. Our uh, it's on the public site. Yeah, mm -hmm. anybody. Wow. So yeah. these are, are they just meetings where you talk? I didn't know this. I may, yeah. start, I may yeah. start going. You can just call yeah, in and no. listen? Yes, you can call. If you go to our um, NASA Goddard um, site, it gives you the telecon connection or the WebEx connection, and we discuss. There's a lot of nitty gritty detail that we discuss, like, <laughs> you know, what about this graph? But But it's all kept as public as possible. Um, well, that and seems... we are always interested in, of course, getting public input on what we're doing. That seems unusual. This is this in an effort to be super transparent about the the, the yes. missions themselves. Oh, yeah. That's... We were asked by headquarters to be as connected to the community as possible, and we took that seriously. Starting our first summer with large community outreaches to get their ideas of what they thought was important to study. Let me, let me add something here. Uh, Margaret is exactly right. It's very impressive. All four of these missions, and of course, other NASA activities um, are available on their, on their website. Uh, it is a very, I, and I myself check on these websites uh, every other week or so. Very accessible, very informative. Of course, these missions are being led by uh, serious professionals, examples of the two folks we have here, but there are um, aspects or elements of all of their websites that are entirely readable by the literate public. Oh, yeah. It's fascinating stuff, and as almost everybody in our audience are taxpayers, it's well worth their time to see what 
um, their taxes might go for in the next several years as one or maybe more of these missions are funded and flown. Okay, I want to just ask one more question on this and we'll move on to the topic at hand, but I, because this is interesting. Was this something that the science mission directorate does only or is it a Na- NASA-wide sort of initiative now to try and be more transparent with everything it does? Oh, I can't speak for anything beyond science. I can't okay, even actually okay. speak for the science. I'm just telling you what they They wanted. told you. <laughs> okay, they, sure. They told you. They said these have to be pub. And we, we would have done that anyhow. It's a very community-driven. Most of the members guiding the study are from outside of NASA. Okay, well, there you go, folks. So definitely, if, you're, if you want to learn, about, I mean, you really want to get access and behind-the-scenes looks at how these projects and missions are, are, uh, are handled, you might want to go and check that out. You say there's, I guess there's information on the uh, yep. OST website, so um, I should... I'll Just put- type in Origin Space Telescope on Google, and you'll we'll have two websites, one at IPAC Caltech, one at Goddard. Um, they both have... Uh, useful information okay well let's get into ost itself adam synergy i see your question and i agree i want to ask it but first i want to give a little bit of background a little summary and i think maybe david you could do that for us give us some uh i gave a couple of one-liners on what ost is but maybe you can give us a summary on the project science goals sure i'd be happy to do that tony (laughs) um there are three main goals that um that we've been tracking and there are many many other things that we can do with this telescope uh, the three that that motivate things and actually establish requirements for the um, for the engineering design are the first the question are we alone and um, I won't go into details Margaret's going to cover that topic uh, but it, it as you can probably surmise it has something to do with looking for life elsewhere in the universe would you like me to put uh, up that graphic second- or, or not you yep. can you can go ahead and, okay. and talk about that we can freeform this All right, go I ahead, have, Dave. yeah I have the I have it up if you want Okay. Um, do you want to go ahead then, Margaret? Uh, or okay. should I continue with just the, the three highlights? And Why don't then, you do then... the three highlights and then I'll, okay. I'll talk about Okay. So the, the graphic that you're seeing is the first of the three science themes for the mission. The second one is um, when planets form, how do they form and how do some of them become habitable? Uh, how do they acquire the conditions that would enable life to, uh, to be sustained? And then the third goal uh, is looking far into the deep universe far back in time and asking how galaxies work. How does the whole universe work? But in particular, how do galaxies work? Um, So you might recognize some of these themes as themes that are covered by other missions, but every mission is designed to provide uh, unique information and uh, they work together really to uh, to answer these questions. Uh, But these are the three main questions that OST will, uh, will tackle and that it's designed to do. Okay. So now maybe good back to you, Margaret. Yeah. So let's just talk a little bit more about about are we alone? Um, so as uh, Tony mentioned, there are three of these studies that are looking at this question: Are we alone? Um, and we're doing it in a different way than Habex and Louvoir is. We're doing it by if you look in this picture, you'll see um, on the top right kind of a reddish star. That's a picture of an M dwarf, which is one of the most numerous stars in the galaxy. And by far, it's like over 75% of the stars near the Earth um, are M stars. And you can see some black circles going in front, and that um, actually connotes how we're going to observe them. We're going to observe them through the transit method, which is a very um, precise way to learn a lot about these things. Uh, You can learn about their size, their mass, their densities, through just transit me- uh, measurements even before OST flies. And what OST will be doing is selecting some of these can- um, candidates that will be studied by, by tests and JWST and stuff and following up to determine, do they have the spectrum that, I, that we're showing here in front of this um, imagined habitable planet? circling the M dwarf star. And this spectral range that Origin Space Telescope offers is rich in molecular spectroscopy. And it's ideal for understanding um, the composition of the planetary atmosphere and hence life. So here's a spectrum from five to 20 microns. And the key molecules to look for are methane, which is the far left one, um, ozone, which is three oxygens, Um, carbon dioxide, CO2, and water, H2O. And 
uh, according to experts who study atmospheric chemistry, the only way you can get methane in ozone, which is a tracer of oxygen, in, an, in a planetary atmosphere is to have life in the chemical loop. That you need something that is life that is going to translate all the atmospheric things from sort of oxygen into a methane. Um, things like carbon dioxide and water are necessary to support life as we know it. They're called bioindicators. They're indication that life could form. But the ozone and the methane together, the only way we know how to get that is with life. And so if we, and the goal is to basically so you, so you need take both. spectra and you, do, you need both. And the nice thing about the spectral range is you get both in one spectrum and uh, it's a very difficult measurement to make. We think it's within our grasp if we work harder on improving detectors. Uh, but yes, you need both. And this uh, these this wavelength range, five to twenty microns, this is not visible. This is not possible from the ground, is it? Uh, most of it is not. I yeah. mean, there's little bits and pieces, but certainly at the sensitivity and the stability you need, because. Um, I mean, basically, they need all right. They need five parts per million stability um, in the measurement, which is which is a challenge. But we think we uh, we can do it with um, some investment in detectors. Um, but now, yes, now one of the and things you only get that stability in space. Space is incredibly stable compared to being on Earth. And is this going to go to the L two point? Yes. Okay. Now. One of the things that JWST promises, if it launch, when it launches, is the is, is a similar capability of looking at the light from a star as it goes through the atmos any atmosphere that might be present in a transiting exoplanet. Uh, right. is, the, is is Origins going to be uh, uh, augmenting that with with a wider wavelength range? Because I don't think JWST goes down that far, does it? Uh, it, it does. It does overlap, but JWST spectrographs were not designed with the same stability in mind. First of all, they split the interesting spectral range with two instruments. We would do one instrument, and then um, you need to design the spectrometer to be um, immune to pointing or jitter instabilities, and then also the detectors have to be um, amazingly stable. And at the time JVST was designed, um, transiting exoplanets was just starting as a field. And of course, it's skyrocketed since then. But the initial design of the spectrometers were never meant to meet these very difficult five parts per million um, stability requirements. And so Origins is actually building a very, very specialized ultra stable spectrometer to do this science case. Now other astronomers will probably think of other things, other uses for it, but it will be designed to hit this science goal. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And, and this is something that it looks like the better, if you can design the instrument with this science case in mind, as you point out, uh, it, it, where it was kind of done after JWST was sort of uh, designed, it, it makes for a better uh, data set. Um, did you want to say anything more about the are we alone part, or do you want to go on to forming habitable, um, well, I'll, I'll just say that, I mean, our goal uh, with the observing strategy is to have one to 10 detections of, of basically habitability around other. Um, what, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand it, what that means. One to uh, 10. Well, okay. One to 10 exoplanets. So they, you know, basically they're going to be picking the best candidates, but the goal is to um, identify at least one to five exoplanets with the signature of methane and ozone that is we we basically detect that there's life on another one and are you going to get your candidates to look at with origins from some other wide field uh, telescope oh like yes tests? yeah okay. exactly awesome. well there's there's a number of people going after these candidates but we think we'll have candidates that will be of course looked at with JWST. but this project this ability to detect biosignatures is beyond JVST capabilities okay and uh, uh let me go ahead and get larry keese's question in because it's relevant to what you're directly talking about right now he's he's asking you could you talk more about the stability requirements that's my nook so what do you okay. mean when you talk about stability right so basically okay imagine these planets orbiting in front of um, the star um Basically, we want everything to be stable 
in the instrument into five parts per million as the planet moves in front and then behind. So in the order of an hour, when it's looking at a star, that the if they see a change, that change is due to the planet and not the instrument. So when we mean the instrument has to be stable, meaning that its ability to detect the flux, it doesn't vary like, oh, it's, you know, uh, you know, 1% higher, low, 1% lower. It's, it's always reading the same measurement. So like, I don't know, um, let's say it, um, I'm trying to think of an equivalent of um, measuring, like measuring temperature. Let's say you're measuring the temperature of something. You want that any temperature change to be measured, like if you're cooking something, that if you see a temperature change, that that is due to something physically happening, not due to the thermometer itself. The thermometer has to be able to um, reflect and be stable with that measurement. And these so, Margaret, Margaret, that was was that your point a few minutes ago when you said five parts in a in a million? Yes. The, um, the noise level. Every instrument has has got noise of various kinds. There's not yes. a perfect instrument. Um, and your calculate your team's calculation of the noise requirement, the noise limit to the instrument is you've got to be able to measure something better than five parts out of a million. That's right. And so this is stability. So it's a differential measurement. So you're measuring the flux of the star and you're subtracting that flux, but any variation in that flux has to be, the instrument has to be stable to five parts per million because the signal itself is only, you know, a factor of three times that, you know, it's 15 yeah. parts per million. So you have to measure it to five parts per million to get a significant detection of it. Well, while we're so on. Maybe this might help as well. So typically, uh, what would be a typical decrease in brightness broadband, that is a, a wide range in wavelengths, of an Earth-like star passing in front of a typical M dwarf? How much is the light reduced by the eclipse, if you will, of a, of a planet like the Earth passing in front of an M dwarf star? That's a good question. I don't know it off the top of my head. I know it's actually, it's um, fairly deep compared to what it would be in front of a solar-like star, just because the contrast between the planet, planet is bigger compared to the star. Um, you could me, just say a small fraction of a percent. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm even thinking Something it's pretty less tiny. than that. It's tiny. Yeah, I'm going to say maybe 10 to the minus 4. Yeah, so and then because you all are looking for spectral features, which can be smaller still, that's why you need this incredible instrument stability. Yes. Okay, let me just, while we're on this topic, ask you, what a typical measurement would look like then uh, what would be an exposure time that would as the planet is transiting the uh, star surface how what are what are your planned exposure times going to be for these spectra uh, we're going to be reading them out uh, as they go so the exposure time might be on the order of seconds or minutes depending on how bright the star is they'll be continuously recorded sent down for analysis and it'll be spectral, so it won't be broadband, as we just discussed. It'll be basically a spectrum looking, um, you know, like the spectrum you see in this uh, cartoon drawing of what we're trying to get. It will be a spectrum of all the wavelengths at once, all simultaneously. Um, so kind the, of the, low, the, low resolution in the sense that it'll be what they, you know, um, it won't be the highest spectral resolution, but... It, high enough that we can separate the features. So through the 5 to 20 micron range, the light from the star will be split up into a spectrum. Yes. And then that light, that split, that spectra will be recorded continuously. The shutter will just be open. Light will be coming in, yes. falling in on the spectrograph. And then the spectra are recorded continuously as the planet goes across the face of the sun, disk of the sun, Yes. Star, I should say. And then uh, those readings are then, I guess, do you co-add them down on the ground to make a stronger signal or do you not need to do that? It's, it's not oh, an yeah, image. Yeah, yeah. No, no. In fact, they, they talk about how many transits do you need, you know, one transit. And they said their, their tiered surveys is, you know, the first look at, you know, let's say 10 
candidates, good candidates that'll be vetted from prior observations and they'll do one transit. And with that, they'll be able to see if there's water and ozone. Okay. All right. Or good. water and carbon dioxide. And then, and then from that, they'll go all the way up to like 65, 70 transits. And each transit gives you a signal and they co-add all of that. And, and co-add means we're just going to take previous observations and add them to the previous. Keep the adding it together right. to improve the signal to noise, all with five parts per million, and to, to get down to to see basically the methane. Okay. Methane. We are blazing through this hangout, and I want to make sure we get to the other science cases. So let's okay. talk. Let's talk about the next one. Uh, that's the the life uh, detection part, the biosignature part of what Origins is planning to do. Uh, right. But it's also going to be looking at. Uh, habitable planets and how they form who wants to talk about this i've got that graphic up by the way that one is for me to do okay um so let's see this graphic uh it's got words on it that are more complex than probably most of your audience really cares to uh digest but let me just I wouldn't be sure. by saying <laughs> okay well i'd be happy to entertain detailed questions um and maybe i'll even get it right um, so what you're looking at here is is the edge on uh, disk of a uh, of, of a forming planetary system. Um, so this is a slice through that disk. Um, used to be thought that the disks were flatter, uh, that they might be like a pancake or something, but in fact they actually have a flare to them. So you can see the the wedge opening. The star is off on the left here, and so you're only seeing one side of the disk. But if you actually expanded the, the view, you would have the other side of the disk to the left. Um, so one very important feature that you see here is a uh, the dashed line labeled snow line. And the snow line delineates the place where, um, where water is either too warm on the outside of the disk uh, so that it's um, either vaporized or liquid um, or inside the disk where dust uh, shields the, the starlight and it gets quite cold, and it's cold enough for water to be frozen. And when it's frozen, it freezes out on the surfaces of dust grains and uh, things that we would call planetesimals, which are dust gra grains uh, coagulating together uh, to become planets. Um, that planet formation process, uh, there are good theories and uh, minimal observations. Uh, so we really want to understand how planets form and when they form, how, how does water wind up on the surface of a planet like ours that is at the right distance, you could say the Goldilocks distance, so that it, the planet itself can have a liquid ocean. So again, there are uh, theories and some reasons to believe that comets uh, deposited the, uh, the water that's, that makes the Earth's oceans. Um, we can trace that through the signature of uh, the ratio of deuterium uh, to hydrogen, deuterium being a heavier uh, isotope of hydrogen. And that ratio is different in different comets. Um, and in some of them, uh, it's the same as in the Earth's oceans. And that's a clue to the possibility that, that our oceans came from comets um, early in the formation of the solar system. Um, but largely speaking, this theory really needs to be borne out by future observations. And so a very important thing to understand is how is the material distributed in a, in a system like this, the, a disk that's uh, forming planets. And during that process, how does water wind up on the surface of a planet, making it habitable as we understand habitability, which does for at least all of our living critters depend on water. Well, this is a. I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, Andrew Planet's question since it's also relevant to this exact uh, slide. He's asking: Is it true that water, a known life-dependent solvent, is is part and parcel byproduct of stellar evolution? I mean, in this graph here, this water was in the. Uh, I don't know. Was it a debris disk, or I don't know what you call. Uh, uh, I would call this a protoplanetary disk. Protoplanetary disk. Thank you. Uh, it was. It was just already there, right? Yes, uh, that's a really excellent question. So we um, we have measured water uh, in the general interstellar medium. That's the gas and dust clouds between stars. Um, if you look at the Milky Way um, in a nice dark sky, you can see um, dark patches, and those are gas and dust clouds. 
And inside those clouds, it's very cold and the water is frozen. Um, but in the, um, in the warmer part of the interstellar medium outside of those clouds, um, in fact, uh, water is in vapor form, gas form, and it has a spectral signature and that signature has been measured. So we know that water is out there. It's really pretty much all over the place, although it tends to freeze out on dust green surfaces um, when they're cold enough. And uh, so it's not too surprising that there is a reservoir of water out there. It's really the question of how does it wind up on a planet's surface that we want to know about. Okay, great. And this will be done by OST via spectra again? I mean, I don't want to get up to... Yeah. Is this going to look at spectra of the protoplanetary or the yeah, protoplanetary disk and see... Yes, uh, really OST in general um, is very heavily oriented toward spectroscopy, measuring spectral lines. Okay. And um, those... Um, they, they may be a little bit less sexy for, uh, you know, for the general public to look at. They're, they just look like graphs, like the one that Margaret showed a moment ago. <laughs> um, but in fact, that's where all the information is. Um, so, so to an astronomer, a spectrum is very rich with information, and that's what OST is largely designed to, um, to give us. It does make images, too, and I'm sure we'll hear about that along the way. Yeah. Okay. And the final science case, uh, I love this question. Um, how does the universe work? I've got the graphic up. OST will study galaxy and black hole co-evolution. Yes. Right. <laughs> so, so one of the cool things about uh, Origin Space Telescope is that uh, it can look at the redshifted universe. Um, so this plot um, has has two axes on the right and the the um, y-axis. It's the observed wavelength. And this kind of covers the observed wavelength starting with basically all the way um, to about the background, Roma, which is, Let me try um, muting. Okay. Which is a, a millimeter, ground-based millimeter observatory. And Origin Space Telescope basically gets to observe the universe in between where JWST drops off and Alma picks up. So it fills a very important probe of galaxy and black hole evolution that is really not accessible in any other way. Um, on the x-axis, we have redshift. Um, and then on the left, we see what we call a spectral energy distribution, which is basically the flux per unit wavelength of a galaxy. Um, so as it, um, starting at the top, at the longest wavelength, as you come up, you see kind of a, a peak. And that's basically um, dust emission from the interstellar medium, which is the birthplace of stars. And uh, it's, if you will, the fuel of star and galaxy evolution. Um, and then um, <clears throat> as you go down, downwards, you're actually picking up, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, information on the shorter wavelengths and then um, also information on, on the stars. And there are lots of points or, you know, spikes on this spectral energy distribution and those spikes are spectral lines. So these are the um, things like, you know, you'll see hydrogen or you'll see magnesium or iron. And these spectral lines, if you detect them, tell you a lot about the physics of what is actually going on in that galaxy. Um, and we'll be able, with these spectral lines, be able to trace things like the active galactic nuclei. That's this in red on the ground, on the, on the lowest part, on the, on the left. Uh, all the things that are red are, will basically be spectral lines that say, what is the AGN activity in this galaxy? And then in green is what is the feedback? So AGN blow winds provide feedback to the galaxy stars when they're born they blow around the gas that provides the feedback. And then at top, and perhaps the most numerous of the lines in blue, is what is happening with the star formation. You can probe the rate, um, the how, how many stars of what type are in the galaxy. So all this spectral information will be gone in one go with Origin Space Telescope over a huge spectral range over key points, like the peak of galaxy evolution at Redshift 2, which is the first dash line from the from the left, or the peak um, epoch of reionization, which is out at Redshift um, longer than six Redshifts. And so you'll be able to probe all these key parts and learn about, uh, in particular, the gas that's feeding all this activity in a galaxy. So Origin Space Telescope is going to be absolutely key for understanding how do galaxies and black holes co-evolve, 
um, what what triggers them. I mean, galaxies were very different in the past. And the key difference is in the past, you had more gas compared to stars in all these galaxies. And so origins that will be absolutely provide fundamental breakthroughs in how we understand this whole process. And since we observe the universe basically through galaxies, it's going to really tell us how the universe actually works. Did you design this graphic, Margaret? I did not. There is a lot of information in There here. is a lot of information here. It's <laughs> densely packed. But I, I think the main thing it's amazing. I want, want the, the audience to take away is that Origins is going to fill in this critical gap in how galaxies evolve over this redshift space because it really fills in a wavelength range we cannot do from the ground. So, yeah, it looks like about uh, if you look at the arrows uh, of JWST versus Alma, there's that there's that yellowish band across the center that says what origins will look like. And it looks like it's going to be active from about redshift four through on, actually, uh, and be able to see all of these different uh, spectra of these different uh, three uh, events or, or feedback mechanisms, star formation, AGNs, things like that, uh, all the right. way through very, very distant wavelengths uh something that right. jwst nor not Al alma now alma is a ground based by the way folks uh sub millimeter array that is uh one of the most high resolution uh radio telescopes ever uh commissioned and it's an amazing unit and it tells us a lot but it has limits and this is filling in the gap there of what that limit is. This is really a, a really cool graphic actually. <laughs> okay, well let me um let me so those are the science cases of what the origin space telescope is hoping to address uh if it is uh built and and um and let me just get to a couple uh, Raj Luther has some really good questions. I want to get to a couple of them here. Um he's asking how accurate will origins be compared to other space telescopes? I guess comparing the kinds of observations that you know JWST will do versus um, what origins can do. How much more accurate will it be? Um, will it be more accurate um, in terms of detecting um, objects and stuff by orders of magnitude? So, you know, prior observatories like Spitzer and Herschel said, "Oh, we we have we've detected you know um, water in three disks." Well, Origins is going to detect water in thousands of disks very easily. And so in terms of when you think of anything, any scientific study, you need statistics. You need large numbers. Um, so in terms of measuring more things to get better statistics, that is one area uh, of improvement. There'll be also spectral accuracy. So the more you spread the light out, the more accurate you can get wavelengths and also um, the motion, the kinematics, the dynamics of what's happening with the gas. And that's something that Origins will do more precisely um, in these galaxies um, than has been done before. And then just detectors and our ability to calibrate how bright things really are um, will be better. Um, and so all those things will be a, a big improvement. Okay. Uh, let me, and one more question from Raj, then I want to get to the spacecraft itself. Um, uh, he's asking Raj Luthra, how far back in the universe time will Origins see? Now, I'll put this graph back up again, um, and it was showing that uh, you're going out, well, the Redshift 8 is one of the ones, but presumably it can go back even further. Um, we think that um, there'll be... I mean, it won't be, uh, it, it, I would say we might go back to redshift 10 or 12 on on particular cases. Um, at redshift 6, we're going to get all the galaxies. <laughs> yeah. We will see all the galaxies, full sample all the way down to very tiny galaxies and get a very good statistical sample out to at least redshift 6. But there'll be, you know, either really bright objects or very interesting and exotic objects that will go out to redshift 10, 12, possibly beyond, possibly seeing the first galaxies form um, if we see them, you know, in front of a gravitational lens that helps this out. But, um, and I, I know people will go after those because oh, yeah, they're doing it that's what astronomers, <laughs> that's yeah. what astronomers do. Gravitational um, lensing is our friend so, for sure. So we, we, we think that that will be one of those... Uh, high reward observing programs that we know the TAC will allow time for people to hunt for that. Okay. TAC is a time allocation committee. And, yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It might be helpful to, the, to some of the audience 
um, to convert, you have to make assumptions about the, about the universe to convert red shifts. <laughs> yes, I do that all the time. How, yes, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> red shift eight, for example, to how long was that after the Big Bang? Or how short was that actually after the Big Bang? Oh, you know, I think, I mean, they're hoping for the ones that are really, really far out there and forming galaxies the first time. I think they're, they're hoping they're going to detect things within the first billion years of... First. basically the big bang you know yeah get, get okay. very close to the first galaxies yes yeah i mean they're they're i mean um this is a stretch case for origins i would say but um astronomers always seem to, to seem to get there when you give them a facility but they're hoping to see the formation of the first galaxies yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the uh, spacecraft. I'm looking at the time. Uh, let's talk about the spacecraft a little bit. I have the graphic that you guys sent of the concept of the spacecraft itself. Uh, who wants to talk a little bit about it? Hi, that Dave. That would be my doing. Um, <clears throat> so, first of all, apologies for the uh, thunderstorm in the background. Every now and then, that uh, that's Is that louder what that than was? me. Yep, that's what that was. Um, so you see on your screen a, a picture of what we're calling our second concept for the Origin Space Telescope. We've already completed a uh, study of, of a first concept, which actually more closely resembles JWST, um, for those of your audience who recognize what JW looks like. Um, this was quite different. This, the architecture here uh, looks a lot more like the Spitzer Space Telescope, where the, the telescope itself is surrounded by a tubular kind of thing to keep it cold. Um, so let me um, let me step back before I go into some of these little highlights here and say that um, when when you conduct a study like this, part of it is what we just walked you through, which is the, the science. The science has to be absolutely compelling, uh, rock solid, very exciting um, things that people really, really want to get the answers to. Um, but then, then there's a whole second ingredient, which is that you want to maximize the bang for the buck. And so that's where the engineering design comes into play and a lot of back and forth between the science goals and the, um, the engineering design work. And so um, our concept one was a first cut uh, look at how you might uh, implement this mission. And concept two is a second round of iteration on that that greatly improves the, um, the bang for the buck. Um, one of the ways that it does that is by um, borrowing a, uh, an architecture that's been used before. So we call that heritage. Um, and this has heritage that, that uh, resembles the Spitzer Space Telescope or the Herschel Space Telescope or the Planck Observatory. Um, and in addition, um, a very important part of this design is that it has very few deployments. In other words, moving parts. Um, it, it launches just about the way you see it here, and the way you see it here is the way it will appear when it's used. Um, so it's got a couple of uh, layers of sun shades that you can see on the left-hand side there. Uh, the telescope is, is uh, nestled down in the middle, uh, surrounded by that tubular structure. In order to um, operate over the wavelengths that, um, that OST is designed to cover, which is from 5 microns to 610 microns, um, it, uh, it gains its tremendous sensitivity through two means. One is that the telescope is extraordinarily cold, about four degrees above absolute zero or four degrees Kelvin. And the second thing that we do is to use um, the best possible detectors, uh, detectors that are in development now, but not fully mature yet. But we know we can get there. You're about to hear thunder again, uh, okay. I think. <laughs> Just a forewarning. Um, so anyway, those two things, the cold temperature and the detectors, make make for that factor of, of 10,000 improvement in sensitivity over any past far infrared mission. Um, you do uh, certainly benefit in, in sensitivity by having a large collecting area to collect the light with the telescope. And this particular implementation of OST has the same collecting area, 25 square meters, as JWST. Now, some of your, your listening audience probably knows that JWST is a hexagonal uh, primary mirror. This one is round instead. Uh, so there are some detailed differences, um, but 
well, all sorts of detailed differences, but um, but these are some of the key features of the design. So let me turn it back to you in case there are some questions on this topic. Okay, I just uh, I want to apologize to people who kept seeing the other graphic blinking in the place. I had accidentally made a playlist and didn't know it. So it kept going back and forth between the two images of the how the universe works in this one. I think I finally have it fixed now. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this is going to be the... Um, the uh, preliminary design of origins and my question has to do with um uh okay so i know this is a sensitive subject but when i was reading an atlantic ar uh, article on jwst and i think it listed that you know it was talking about the culture at nasa and some of the optimistic um uh, ways in which NASA has been thinking uh, that they listed and they didn't list in the article that there were about 10 technologies that had to be invented uh, in order to meet the science case of JWST, which is one of the reasons why it uh, it's, it's, uh, it's over budget and behind schedule. So my question to you is how many, are there any technologies with OST that are in that case where they have yet to be invented uh, in order for the science to be done with OST? That's a very fair concern, and uh, the answer is yes. Um, the two principal technologies um, are the detectors and the um, and the cryocoolers that make things that remove heat from the telescope and make things cold. Um, now, the the nice thing about the cryocoolers is that there's a uh, cryocooler uh, in JWST that's already passed that uh, that test essentially, uh, so it's already a mature technology. Okay. So we have really one area uh, that, that requires technology uh, maturation, and that's detectors. Uh, we have, um, for the far infrared, we use different kinds of detectors at different wavelength ranges, and they have different kinds of requirements on them. Um, one nice thing about the far infrared detectors is that there are two different competing technologies uh, that are primarily the ones that are in the running, and both of them are developing in parallel. Uh, there is NASA investment presently in these detectors, and they are maturing, although not at the, the pace we would love to see. I mean, if this, if OST is accepted by the decadal survey, then funding will increase for, for detector technology for this mission, um, and the, the pace of development will certainly pick up. But we really, you know, the basic answer to your question is we have one principal area that, that needs technology work, not 10, and that's the detectors. Okay, well, that's a good, okay, so let's, I want to I want to dive into that a little bit because of one of the things in this Hangout is we're, we're trying to get more technical, more of the astronautical aspect of these uh, missions. And one of my question is, with infrared astronomy in particular, it's been made possible in large part by things like Mercad Telluride detectors. That I, they're better, I think, in near infrared wavelength, something on the uh, you know, one to five micron range. Uh, what detectors are you needing, and what are the technologies that are being looked at uh, in this wavelength range? So, at the very shortest wavelengths, the Mercad detectors are a possibility. Um, at the long wavelengths, uh, where um, well, two of our principal instruments operate, two out of the four instruments on OST. Uh, use far infrared detectors, and the two ty types of detectors I was referring to that are both uh, in the running. Uh, one is transition edge sensor bolometers. A bolometer is basically a thermometer, um, but these are extraordinarily sensitive uh, thermometers. And then a uh, an M kid, which is a, it's, the M usually it stands for microwave, but it's a shorter wavelength ac um, application of a kinetic inductance detector. That's the kid part, so M kids. Um, so both of these things have pros and cons, and uh, both have the potential to, pr to provide the extraordinary sensitivity uh, that we need. Okay, and. So I've got the uh, diagram or the the uh, concept back up again, and we're looking at these two shields uh, or protector uh, ranges. These are based similarly to JWST. The shape is obviously different, but there's two main coolant uh, layers here. Is that right? To get it well, to it's more 4K? than two. So the two that you're pointing to on the far left there are yeah. are nothing more than um, sun shades. Oh, I see. Um, each, each one, you know, behind the other gets a little cooler progressively. But then the the tubular structure itself has a couple of additional layers. Uh, there's what we call a um, a barrel and then a baffle, and 
uh, at each different um, stage, you get progressively cooler and you design the observatory so that you maximally take advantage of cryocooler technology. And a cryocooler has certain uh, temperature stages that it's happiest working at. Um, one of them, just for example, is 70 Kelvin. Okay. Uh, there's another one, you know, at some cooler temperature, and then finally you get down to the four Kelvin that you really want. And the people, of course, are concerned, well, how do you make such a big thing cold? Is this really hard? Um, the answer to this is really that it, it's just thermodynamics. It's physics. It's very well understood physics. So you can you, you make a design that looks the way you see it here in this picture, and you you ask about how much radiation from the sun, uh, which is a principal um, you know warming element, uh, how much reaches each layer, and how much uh, conduction thermal conduction can happen from warm parts to cool parts. So you understand all the, the heating parts and you do a thermal balance. So you understand that if you want the, such and such a layer to reach such and such a temperature, let's say 70 degrees Kelvin, then you have to be able to remove a certain amount of heat. And eventually the, you have a four degree Kelvin layer and you need a certain amount of heat to be removed from that layer to keep its equilibrium temperature four degrees Kelvin. And so it's just thermal design, basically, and thermodynamics that tells you how much heat you have to remove. And then you can look at the cryocooler technology, and you know that the cryocooler technology is capable of removing a certain amount of heat at each of its various different temperature stages. Okay, Larry Keyes is asking, what's the diameter of the telescope? And I'm looking at the third bullet point here. Telescope has a 25 square meter collecting area, the same as JWST. Is that right? The same? It is right. Um, it's a 5.9 meter diameter telescope, and it has a central hole that's 0 0.9 meters um, in diameter. So you, this is what we call a three mirror and a stigmat um, optical configuration. So you can see a, a little secondary mirror that's uh, hanging out in front of the primary mirror, um, and the, the light bounces off the, the main 5.9 meter diameter mirror, reflects off of that, that secondary mirror, and then bounces through the central hole in the in this primary mirror. And this is designed for minimal deployment. The JWST was going to be unfolded because it had to be fit in an Ariane 5 rocket. This one has to fit on SLS. And I'm not seeing hexagonal um, things in there, little segments or anything. This is going to be one optical element? No, no, it's there's going to be segments. Yeah, go ahead, but Margaret. Then it'll be, um, oh, okay. instead of hexagonal, they're going to be more keystone, which is more what they used with Herschel. And um, we did it because we wanted to maximize the area within the rocket fairing. Got it. And if you do the hexagonal thing, uh, yeah, you it's more it's less efficient to fit fit as much air we wanted to make it a, a as big as jwst was okay. a science limit and and larry keese is also asking about the he wants you say he's asking uh is it passively cooled uh due to stability is that why you're passively the, cooling? baby there is passive cooling uh with the sun shields and stuff is it due to stability i think it, they have some radiators and things like that okay um, you do it both by so, shooting it yeah. and, and with radiate, radiating the light away. Okay. Uh, so the rest of that, the answer to that question is that it's, it's cooling at different stages, all with the design to get down to four degrees Kelvin for, for the purpose of sensitivity. It's not temperature stability, although it will be very stable, but that's not the driving requirement. Now, this is a question Peter Quinn asks on a lot of Hangouts, but it's important, and I think it's part of a um, uh, NASA mandate, I think, for missions going forward. But he goes, can we send missions to maintain it, like the Parker Solar Probe, if tech for that becomes comes around? This is going to go to the L2 point. Are you designing it so that it can be maintained? Yes. I think what you mean is serviced. Well, I, that's okay. Yeah, serviced. Yeah. I'm, I'm using yeah, his no. words. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in fact, we lucked out because our study manager, Ruth Carter, actually did servicing stuff. And so she's going to write up some concept about how you could go about servicing something like this in a conceptual level. Yeah. Now, everybody has to do this going forward, right? I mean, everybody, because yes. yeah. this is what NASA has, uh, has talked yes. about. Okay. Yes. 
So, so can I just add a couple of words on that? No. I, no I'm kidding, nope. of course. <laughs> oh, all right. Okay, so they, I'll, I'll just say that the actual mandate is to be serviceable, which doesn't necessarily mean that you will take advantage of that in, in real life, but you may. Um, but even if we, um, now it would have a great advantage if we can service it, then we can replenish its propellant and extend its lifetime. We can replace instruments and extend its, um, its science capability and, and lifetime. Um, but there is a, um, a secondary kind of uh, advantage to designing for um, serviceability, which is that uh, by doing so, you, you make the, uh, the instruments uh, sort of installable in a modular kind of way. And that helps a lot during the integration and test of the whole observatory. Um, so it's, it's a side benefit, but a significant one. Yeah, all of this kind of begs the question, I guess, what do we mean by serviceability? So part of it is that. It has to be modular in design. The components need to be reasonably uh, able to be removed and replaced. What else goes into that definition of serviceable? That you can grab it. So you grab have to it. have like a grappling hook or something like that. And not necessarily by a, by, a, by a person, though, either, right? These aren't necessarily requiring astronauts to go out and do it. But, uh, but That's right. But yes. robots could do it as well. We had a hangout Absolutely. on that. Absolutely. Uh, where, yeah. where there's companies looking at this very issue. How can they, they're making, they're looking, making a business model on, on maintaining and servicing what's up already in space. So that's what I guess we mean by serviceability. And that is good because um, these, as, as Hubble has shown the value of that, uh, uh, I think if anything, even given its difficult beginnings. Um, okay. James Dugan is asking a question. It's, it's, a, it's an honest one. We, uh, we heard with the, um, with the cost overruns of JWST that it, the NASA administrator is already, uh, hinting that this may affect W first, which is the next big wide field infrared survey telescope, the next big successor to, I guess, James Webb, although it won't be doing the same kinds of things. Uh, it's a wide field uh, telescope that has the same resolution as Hubble, but a much, much wider field of view. Uh, and it might be inf affected by this, although for other reasons as well, not necessarily JWST. So the question is, is JWST budget blowout and other missions over budget affecting this process not only origins but as well as links and habex and all the others and you I, mean, I i don't know i i possibly but that's something science mission director at uh, we have not been told we need to shift our schedule start date later we've been given a certain set of parameters assuming this will go in 2030 Okay, good. That was the next thing yep. I wanted to get to. When, yeah. you're, when are you expecting this I mean, to go out? That has not been changed. Um, but Dave, do you have any other comments on this? Well, there, there are many effects, um, but certainly the schedule is, uh, is a possible um, area of impact. Um, like you said, we haven't been told about any schedule delay. It's way, way, way too early to know, you know how that all will ripple through. Uh, there are so many factors that come into play. Um, so you, you really wind up uh, rolling with the punches as these things go. Um, but there, are, I think it's worth pointing out that there are many other things that we're learning from the JW and other past mission experience that we apply lessons as we design this thing. Um, certainly um, from day one, we, we, we designed this knowing that it would have to be a very cold telescope. And so there were things that JWST did in its uh, thermal design that we recognized right off the bat were not the right things to do if you want to make a cold telescope, a very cold telescope like this one. So that, um, that, that addresses and, Galaxia's question, why does a different cooling system have to be invented than the one JWST has? That's a lessons learned kind of thing then, right? It, it is. Well, they're technical lessons um, in terms of where you put warm things relative to cold things, huh. I think is the most important aspect of that. Okay. Um, yeah. And... Um, we, we've certainly, I think, convinced ourselves that it's very important to um, to be, uh, you know, not not a deployable telescope. Um, unfortunately, because of the JW delay, the decadal survey won't have the opportunity to know that JW can succeed as it's designed to do. I know this is starting um, to affect so, a ripple effect, isn't it? It's starting to affect other decadal surveys. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, in any case, um, 
you know, if you can if you can have a non-deployable system and accomplish your goals, that's uh, that's a nice advantage. And so we wanted to make that happen. <laughs> I know we're all going to be really <laughs> tense during that deployment. Let me. Let, so we're all... here's a schedule. Here's a schedule question for our audience. So that uh, and when we began, uh, Margaret gave us a brief summary of what the next, well, roughly next twelve months is going to be like for this team. Um, when is uh, cur- according to current plan? When will the decadal survey be completed and their priorities and selection and advice and so on be known? Oh, wow. Uh, Well, I don't think we've been given that schedule. I think they're working on it. Um, My guess is we'll know in 2020, 2021. Uh, It takes, I mean, they're starting to gear up now, but it takes, it's a couple year process. That's why I'm saying possibly a year after would be the earliest summer 2020 i think will be the earliest that we hear about things yeah oh. so we hope to have you we're, we're not wrapping up quite yet we hope to oh, actually we might be yeah we will have you guys back yeah but hold on i got what i want to just uh ask i want to end uh this hangout with a really good question from astro malone mm-hmm. this is a good ending question uh what plans are made uh to follow this mission up if you are successful and what would it mean to you personally if it's a success, if you guys get picked? Wow. Hmm. Would you well, like to start, Margaret? I would be extremely thrilled, uh, not just for myself, for the astronomy community, because the discovery space of this mission is enormous. And it'll be very exciting to see what people find with it. Um, I'm going to let Dave handle a follow-up. Like, what would you follow this up with? Okay, well, I think I, I understand your pitch there. Um, but before <laughs> I go in that direction, um, and thanks for that, um, the first thing I would say is that uh, at, at many uh, astronomical gatherings, uh, where rarely, but sometimes I wear a tie, and one of the ties I wear has little children on it in various different professionals. The reason being that um, I, I like to point out to people that uh, what we're doing now is not for us. It's really for the next generation. This is certainly not going to happen anytime soon. I'll be really happy if I'm still alive when it happens. Um, but uh, it's really for the next generation of, of astronomers. And uh, then to pick up where Margaret left off uh, and really to kind of get to the technical part of, you know, how would you follow up with um, with a telescope like this? Um, one way that, that you could do that is with an interferometer. And one thing that, um, that OST will, will be lacking is um, a high angular resolution, uh, a sort of crisp picture, um, the fine details of things if you make an image of something. So those um, protoplanetary disks, for example, or very distant galaxies, those will look like little specks of light to us. So we're very interested in the spectrum that comes from those objects, but it would be very interesting to, to map out, you know, a spectrum here and a spectrum there all within the same object to learn how the materials distributed um, in a galaxy or a um, or a protoplanetary system that will get us to the next level of detail, and we can certainly do amazing things with an interferometer. Not, uh, uh, you're, but you're not from multiple telescopes. But it wouldn't be something like LISA, right? It would be something optical. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, it would be optical interferometry working at far infrared wavelengths, though. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's all possible. All right. Well, Harley, I think we've got another Hangout uh, um, uh, behind us now. I want to thank our guest, uh, Margaret Meixner, for the Space Telescope Science Institute. She's on sabbatical at thank Goddard you. right now. And thank you. And also uh, David Lisowitz, from, uh, also from Goddard. Uh, both of these guys are working on the Origin Space Telescope uh, as part of the uh, plan for NASA to follow up. Uh, on future decadal surveys, we've got JWST, then W first, and then whatever these guys uh, choose for the next one. And one of the runners up is uh, this this one. This was an exciting mission. I hope uh, it's uh, we, you guys have learned a little bit more about it. Um, sort of, I kind of wish that NASA and the National Academy of Sciences would let the public vote on it, but then I guess that would be sort of a I don't know, maybe counterproductive. I don't know, <laughs> but it would be fun to see a day, to be able to. Um, uh, participate in some of the selection process here but these guys have done their homework on some really great stuff i hope you guys have learned some stuff from it i want to thank all of you for watching it and I, we have i want to thank my yes yeah, so gravi- <laughs> gra- gravitational wave rubber thank duckies you guys. 
Rubber duckies. Yeah, mine's mine's a, a, a Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So mine's just yeah. an average. Yeah, see, know. mine can arrest yours, Harley, for riding for riding the gravitational waves too long. That's that's the United States. <laughs> that's <an R. laughs> <laughs> okay folks all right well thank you all so much for watching and as always oh uh next week i've got uh a hangout with uh uh we, i think we are going to do a telescope talk finally i've also got a uh ground-based uh hangout i'm going to do a one-off with christian ready on tuesday uh watch for that also uh on next week is the astro coffee hangout and carol christian and i will be back talking about the latest discoveries in astronomy uh from a paper that she will select and i think i'll learn more about that hopefully early next week so i will see you guys then next time harley we are going to be are we doing uh another mission next time or are we doing uh no, the I gateway do not, do not know okay so, we're I mean, still waiting I, I should, but i don't have it in hand. well we have we have confirmations and things that we're waiting on so thanks margaret thanks david i hope you guys will come back when we learn more about what's going on uh absolutely summer summer next year right happy to yeah all right yeah. Here we go. Good luck, guys. <laughs> All right. Thank All right. you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. 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 Thank you guys for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Looking up. Yes, I want to say say goodbye again to David Lester. <laughs> 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 I do not. Yeah. Have.